tonight to listen to Ronald Wright give the third of this year's Massey Lectures, collectively called A Short History of Progress. Tonight from the Place Riel Theatre at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon, Fool's Paradise, the third of the 2004 Massey Lectures. Here's Ronald Wright. It's a great honor for me, a very daunting honor, I might add, to be here tonight to uh, give the Massey Lecture. Uh, and a great pleasure to be in Saskatoon. I, uh, when I first came to Canada from England, uh, well, my father was from BC, but I grew up in England. When I first came to Canada, I was to go to grad school in the province next door uh, in Calgary, and I often came down this way. I, I've always thought of Saskatoon as actually one of the most delightful cities in the country. It's also um, a great pleasure to be in the province of Tommy Douglas, the cradle of health care, and so many other important ideas that have helped shape this country and make it one of the finest nations in which to live. <laughs> From there to the third lecture entitled Fool's Paradise. The greatest wonder of the ancient world is how recent it all is. No city or monument is much more than 5,000 years old. Only about 70 lifetimes of 70 years have been lived end to end since civilization began. Civilization's entire run therefore occupies a mere 0.002% of the two and a half million years since our first ancestor sharpened a stone. In the last lecture, I outlined the rise and fall of Man the Hunter in the Old Stone Age and how his very progress, his perfection of weapons and techniques, led directly to the end of hunting as a way of life, except in places such as the North American prairies where conditions favored the prey. Next came the discovery of farming, likely by women, during the New Stone Age or Neolithic in several parts of the world. And from that grew our experiment of civilization, which began as many independent enterprises, but in the last few centuries has coalesced, mainly by hostile takeover, into one big system that covers the earth. There are signs that this experiment, like hunting, is now in danger of falling victim to its own success. In the previous talks, I mentioned nuclear weapons and greenhouse gases. The big bang in the atom is obviously far deadlier than the small bangs in millions of engines. But if we are unlucky or unwise, both could end civilization on its present scale. Much simpler technologies have proved fatal in the past. Sometimes the trouble lies in a particular invention or idea but it also lies in social structure, in the way people tend to behave when squeezed together in urban civilizations where power and wealth rise upwards and the many are ruled by the few. In this talk, I want to speak about two traps sprung by progress, one on a small Pacific island, the other on the plains of Iraq. The wrecks of our failed experiments lie in deserts and jungles like fallen airliners whose flight recorders can tell us what went wrong. So archaeology is perhaps the best tool we have for looking ahead because it provides a deep reading of the direction and momentum of our course through time, what we are, where we have come from, and therefore where we are most likely to be going. Unlike written history, which is often highly edited, archaeology can uncover the deeds we have forgotten or have chosen to forget. A realistic understanding of the past is quite a new thing, a late fruit of the Enlightenment, although people of many times have felt the tug of what the Elizabethan antiquarian William Camden called the back-looking curiosity. Antiquity, he wrote, 
hath a certain resemblance with eternity. It is a sweet food of the mind. Not everyone's mind was so open in his day. A Spanish viceroy of Peru, who had just seen the Inca capital high in the Andes, with its walls of giant stones fitted like gems, wrote back to his king, I have examined the fortress that the Incas built, which shows clearly the work of the devil, for it does not seem possible that the strength and skill of men could have made it. Even today, some opt for the comforts of mystification, preferring to believe that the wonders of the ancient world were built by Atlanteans, gods or space travelers instead of by thousands toiling in the sun. Such thinking robs our forerunners of their due, but us of their experience, because then one can believe whatever one likes about the past without having to confront the bones, potsherds, and inscriptions which tell us that people all over the world, time and again, have made similar advances and mistakes. About two centuries after the Spanish invasion of Peru, a Dutch fleet in the South Seas, far to the west of Chile and below the Tropic of Capricorn, came upon a site hardly less awesome and even more inexplicable than the megalithic buildings of the Andes. On Easter Day, 1722, the Dutchmen sighted an unknown island so treeless and eroded they mistook its barren hills for dunes. They were amazed as they drew near to see hundreds of standing stone images as tall as an Amsterdam house. We could not comprehend how it was possible that these people who are devoid of heavy thick timber or strong ropes nevertheless had been able to erect such images which were fully 30 feet high. Captain Cook later confirmed the island's desolation finding no wood for fuel nor any fresh water worth taking on board. He described the island as tiny canoes made from scraps of driftwood stitched together like shoe leather as the worst in the Pacific. Nature, Cook concluded, had been exceedingly sparing of her favors to this spot. The great mystery of Easter Island that struck all early visitors was not just that these colossal statues stood in such a tiny and remote corner of the world but that the stones seemed to have been put there without tackle, as if set down from the sky. The Spaniards who had credited the devil with the splendors of Inca architecture were merely unable to recognize another culture's achievements. But even scientific observers could not, at first, account for the megaliths of Easter Island. The figures stood there mockingly, defying common sense. We now know the answer to the riddle and it's a chilling one. With all due respect to Captain Cook, nature had not been unusually stingy with her favors. Pollen studies of the island's crater lakes have shown that it was once well watered and green, with rich volcanic earth supporting thick woods of the Chilean wine palm, a fine timber that can grow as big as an oak. No natural disaster had changed that, no eruption, no drought or disease, the catastrophe on Easter Island was man. <laughs> Rapa Nui, as Polynesians call the place, was settled during the 5th century AD by migrants from the Marquesas or the Gambiers, arriving in big catamarans stocked with their usual range of crops and animals. Dogs, chickens, edible rats, sugar cane, bananas, sweet potatoes, and mulberry for making bark cloth. Easter Island proved too cold for breadfruit and coconut palms, but was rich in seafood. Fish, seals, porpoises, turtles, and nesting seabirds. Within five or six centuries, the settlers multiplied to about 10,000 people, a lot for 64 square miles. They built villages with good houses on stone footings and cleared all the best land for fields. Socially, they split into clans and ranks nobles, priests, commoners, and there may have been a paramount chief or king. Like Polynesians on some other islands, each clan began to honor its ancestry with impressive stone images. 
These were hewn from the yielding volcanic tuff of a crater and set up on platforms by the shore. As time went on, the statue cult became increasingly rivalrous and extravagant, reaching its apogee during Europe's high Middle Ages while the Plantagenet kings ruled England. Each generation of images grew bigger than the last, demanding more timber, rope, and manpower for hauling to the ahu, or altars. Trees were cut faster than they could grow, a problem worsened by the settlers' rats who ate the seeds and saplings. By AD 1400, no more tree pollen is found in the annual layers of the crater lakes. The woods had been utterly destroyed by both the largest and the smallest mammal on the island. We might think that in such a limited place where, from the height of Terevaca, islanders could survey their whole world at a glance, steps would have been taken to halt the cutting, to protect the saplings, to replant. We might think that as trees became scarce, the erection of statues would have been curtailed and timber reserved for essential purposes, such as boat building and roofing. But that is not what happened. The people who felled the last tree could see it was the last, could know with complete certainty that there would never be another, and they felled it anyway. All shade vanished from the land, except the hard-edged shadows cast by the petrified ancestors, whom the people loved all the more because they made them feel less alone. For a generation or so, there was enough old lumber to haul the great stones and still keep a few canoes seaworthy for deep water. But the day came when the last good boat was gone. The people then knew there would be little seafood and, worse, no way of escape. The word for wood, rakau, became the dearest in their language. Wars broke out over ancient planks and worm-eaten bits of jetsam. They ate all their dogs and nearly all the nesting birds. And the unbearable stillness of the place deepened with animal silences. There was nothing left now but the moai, the stone giants who had devoured the land. And still these promised the return of plenty if only the people would keep faith and honor them with increase. But how will we take you to the altars? asked the carvers. And the Moai answered that when the time came, they would walk there on their own. So the sound of hammering still rang from the quarries, and the crater walls came alive with hundreds of new giants, growing even bigger now that they had no need of human transport. The tallest ever set on an altar is over 30 feet high and weighs 80 tons. The tallest ever carved is 65 feet long and more than 200 tons, comparable to the greatest stones worked by the Incas or Egyptians. Except, of course, that it never budged an inch. By the end, there were more than a thousand Moai, one for every ten islanders in their heyday. But the good days were gone, gone with the good earth, which had been carried away on the endless wind and washed by flash floods into the sea. The people had been seduced by a kind of progress that becomes a mania, an ideological pathology, as some anthropologists call it. When Europeans arrived in the 18th century, the worst was over. They found only one or two living souls per statue, a sorry remnant, in Cook's words, small, lean, timid and miserable. The Europeans heard tales of how the warrior class had taken power, how the island had convulsed with burning villages, gory battles, and cannibal feasts. Daggers and spearheads became the commonest tools on the island, hoarded in pits like the grenades and assault rifles kept by modern-day survivalists. Even this was not quite the nadir. Between the Dutch visit of 1722 and Cook's 50 years later, the people again made war on each other and, for the first time, on the ancestors as well. <laughs>